for um, the next part of our, our um, symposium, we're diving into the challenges and the and the celebrations of what it takes to put sunfish on display. Michael Howard took the lead in the chapter, writing up the chapter for this um, for our book, and um, and it was a highly collaborative endeavor. He. Uh, um, well, the Monterey Bay Aquarium was the first to display in the U.S. The Japanese had been displaying MOLA for quite some time. So um, to put together a chapter on how to display MOLA really uh, required expertise from all corners of the globe. So lots of different countries now have been have been displaying MOLA. Um, and we have representatives from several of those places who will be who'll be talking about different aspects of that right now. So um, maybe, um, Jesse, let's see, uh, can we bring everybody into, in? Ah, all right, we've got Michael, we've got Zhao, and Hugo. Hi, you guys. Hi, hello. Hello. Thank, thank hello. In the meantime, while Michael reboots, I'm gonna introduce you wonderful people. Thank you. So Zhao um, describes himself as a raconteur with a PhD <laughs> in marine biology, um, a three-time TEDx speaker. So that's great. I'm, I'm deeply um, embedded in the TED world. So thank you for, for being a TEDx speaker. Absolutely. Um, started your career studying lemon sharks in Bimini and um, became curator of sharks at the Lisbon, Lisboa Zoo. Um, and then head diver and curator of collections at the Oce Oceanario de Lisboa. And now you have your own company, Flying Sharks, and are a professor at ESTM. Mm -hmm. um, and you have something very interesting, a trilogy called Sex, Sharks, and Rock and Roll, which <laughs> I'm going to look at quite a lot of people interested. Um, Hugo, nice to meet you, Hugo. Hi. He's nice to meet you personally. <laughs> yeah, after so much emailing. Yeah. yeah. Um, assistant curator at Oceanario de Lisboa and has a unique collection to inspire generations to promote behavior change. We're working on husbandry of all sorts of different animals from teleos, from, um, teleos to elasmobranchs. And um, you're going to be talking about, well, um, Zhao will be talking about collections. Um, Hugo will be talking and how we go out and, and actually capture the wild animals. Hugo will be talking about how do we um, feed growth and feeding <laughs> strategy. And then, um, so Zhao, you'll hand off to Hugo. Hugo, then you'll hand off to Michael, hopefully, fingers crossed. And Michael will be talking about data sets and um, long term data sets and, and how that can inform captive management, not only. Um, Husbandry, but but you know the cross pollination between between um, husbandry and um, researchers in the wild. So there's so much that both those groups can learn from each other. Yeah. And the primary research with captive versus wild. So I'm gonna um, we're gonna start off with with Zhao and take it away, and then we'll we'll all come back together, and um, you guys can talk amongst yourselves, and we can entertain some questions. Absolutely. Okay, so let me share my screen here. There we go. Okay, sorry. There we go. Okay, how's that? Uh, can everybody see my screen there? I think we, we can't see your screen quite yet. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, how's this? Ah, uh, there we go. Great. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, I have quite a few slides to cover. I set my timer here so I don't run over my um, my colleagues' times. I don't want to run over Hugo or Michael. So excuse me if I talk a little fast. But uh, here we go. So mm -hmm, there we go. So the very first method of collection of sunfish that the flying sharks had was back in when we started in 2006. We we'll used the set net. This is a commercial fishing operation that's based in the south of Portugal, an area we call the Algarve. Uh, so this is basically um, done to, uh, to trap a bluefin tuna and, and a few other species as well. The animals swim into the Mediterranean and they kind of 
and have this net that drives them to go into this net uh, over here. Or if they're going out of the Mediterranean, they'll also go into there. And then that little ship will harvest these fish every day, two times a day, uh, which is very good because the fish are swimming freely in this huge area, which is big as a football stadium. So there's no, no injury or anything. And they're just pulled out of the water with the vinyl nets. Now, they were then introduced to small holding tanks, you know, with not particularly spectacular water quality, but they seem to handle this pretty well. We would have a residual losses, if, if any at all. Uh, the, the husbandry protocol for these um, temporary holding tanks was pretty simple. You know, they were target fed with this uh, yellow uh, object here. They were fed some shrimp, some gel food. We didn't do any deworming, but they would have some freshwater baths. On, uh, on arrival. Now, the transport protocol back in those days was, was very, very simple. Uh, we would actually pack um, filters on top of the tanks, some 12 volt batteries. And this was, you know, the way we did things back in those days with uh, some Amquel for ammonia, sodium carb and sodium bicarb to uh, buffer pH. So we would supersaturate the water with lots and lots of oxygen. So this was all back in the days that we were allowed to fly on planes, you know, cargo planes and do all these things. Um, most times we would feed oxygen while we were on the ground, but then we would have to have oxygen off while we were up in the, in the air. So this is us moving some sunfish to Atlanta back in 2007. This was a total of 43 hours. Um, you know, again, the same, the same setup I was telling you about, the filters, the, the batteries. This is a very, very old slide from RAW 2008, where I displayed some numbers of this transport. I'm not going to bother you with all this detail. Obviously, I'll be available later if you need all this detailed information, which is most of it is actually in the chapter. Um, you know, but we would supersaturate the water and have only aeration on the flight. No oxygen was allowed. We would take some measurements during these cargo flights. So on arrival, you know, all the animals survived. They would be immediately started targeting feeding as soon as we arrived. And this was pretty much the case one year later when we moved another four animals to Dubai, uh, which is, you know, 44-hour transport. At this time, we actually moved two animals in per tank. We had our friend Philippe Yuk from Antwerp Zoo to come and give us some water. We had prepared this in advance to do a, a water change. Again, very, very old slide back from raw 2009 where we gave a summary i uh, noticed that the bio load here was uh, was quite higher it was uh, nine kilograms per cubic meter you know that it was two two animals per tank but still um you know we arrived with all of the animals alive and well they were began target feeding immediately after arrival and well i'm afraid to say that uh, these animals actually didn't survive long term and nor the ones from Atlanta, but I'll go into that uh, uh, in, in a few slides. Now, then we moved some animals to Stralsund, which is in um, the north of Germany, former East Germany. Uh, we flew with DHL. These guys actually allowed us to have everything on for the duration of the whole transport. So we would have the whole filtration and everything running smoothly. So no problem there. All the animals survived. Again, they began feeding immediately after arrival. They were introduced to the main exhibit. And these animals actually lasted for many, many, many years. In fact, they became their, literally their postcard um, for, the, for the aquarium for quite some time. Then we moved some animals to Singapore over 50 hours, quite a complex um, transport um, where the, uh, the filtration and the oxygen were not allowed to be used during flight. So during flight, it was basically just the water and small aeration units uh, inside the tanks, but still we had the 100% uh, survival. Then we moved some animals to Hirchals, our friends uh, Christina and Martin, who will be uh, our, our co-authors in this chapter as well. And uh, we've been very good friends for many years. We actually moved two animals in these very, very small 600 liter tanks uh, that basically were by themselves for six hours. And still that, that worked pretty good. Um, you know, these animals were introduced to quarantine. Uh, that's Martin right there, handling an animal that actually grew very large in quarantine. And then it was basically moved to the big exhibit where it survived for many, many, many years. In fact, well, one of them is still, uh, in fact, more than one are still there. But again, I'll come back to that later. So this is Christina feeding one of the animals we moved in 2014. This is, you know, 2018. 
that animal, I believe, was lost last year after five years. And it was at a whopping 350 kilos, I believe. But uh, Martin and Christina will correct me if I'm wrong. So then we actually switched our collection uh, method from uh, the Algarve to Peniche, which is where the school is, where I teach. And we actually have a warehouse there. And we basically go out in these purse seiners that only take one hour to come to shore. And then it's basically 30 minutes with a forklift. We, we grab the tank with our little oxygen cylinder and we basically drive the tank to our holding station. And it's so it's very, very fast. Now, in uh, Peniche, we actually have a bit of a more complex uh, protocol there once these animals come in. We use multivitamins and aloe just to you know boof up their immune system with immuno boosters as well. We actually put some betadine in the water uh, every 48 hours, we dose the water with a very small uh, percentage of betadine. Ammonia quenchers, we used to um, use Amquel, now we're using triage. Gel food, intramuscular injections of enrofloxacin, and freshwater baths as well. So these are all the, the things that we do with, the, with these guys. In Peniche, I have a very short video. I'm not going to play all of it because I don't want to bore you. Uh, why is this stupid video not going? <laughs> well, never mind. I'm clicking here the play button and it's just not clicking. Well, no problems. The video is basically one of my colleagues in Peniche uh, feeding the mola with, with the target. And you, it's very cute because you see the, this mola just comes and boom, takes the food very quickly off the target, which is very cute. Let me just give it one last try. No, that's okay. Okay, so then we moved uh, an animal to Moscow, 2018. Again, the sealed um, apparatus. So the animal is inside. Water is about three quarters, more like two thirds to the top. Uh, 12 hours, the tank was completely on its own. Um, the whole transport was 18 hours. Then we moved another animal to Irchals, to our friends at the North Sea Museum in uh, uh, northern Denmark. 12-hour um, transport, six hours, the tank was uh, on its own, right in there. And again, no, no problem at all. Now, at this point, we, our transport protocol was becoming a little more complex. We did this blowdown, meaning that after the animal was inside the tank, we would actually change the water. We would flush the water in and out for about 30 minutes, just to make sure that that initial water you know, gets all that gunk out of their skin, so we would replace it all. We would use this multivitamin and aloe uh, product that we basically would dose the water with it called Paradigm. Uh, we, we found that it works pretty good. It kind of helps them create a, a layer, a protective layer around their skin. Again, ammonia quencher, a betadine, pH buffers, and super saturate the hell out of the water before transport. We, we usually take it up all the way to 300%, 350%. Now, these are the animals at the North Sea Museum in here, Charles. The 2014 uh, animal right here, the 2018 animal here, just beautifully um, swimming around the, the, the diver there. And then we started looking at uh, just literature, thinking, you know, how can we make this even better? And we looked at Dave Powell's book. Would, who, it was actually my wife, who was a graduate from political science, who, ex who told us, the marine biologists, Hey, why don't you look at that uh, book, you know, from your friend at the aquarium? Because I think he actually worked with sunfish. And, uh, and we looked at the book and there it was. And, you know, I had the book in the shelf for 20 years. I read it, but I didn't remember this part where Dave Powell describes how they used to um, clean their sunfish with the praziquantel, with oral praziquantel. So we thought, well, let's, let's, let's try that because there's always been this myth that it's not a good idea to use um, to deworm internally sunfish because there's, you know, again, the myth that it may kill them. But we thought, well, let's, let's give this a try. So we did that. So uh, at the end of last year, or at the end of 2019, early 2020, we actually got a couple of animals and, and we didn't have any clients for them. It was a, a very interesting period because we had the animals and nobody really wanted them. We put them on the newsletters. No one was taking them. So we did our regular protocol. At this point, we switched the antibiotic to cefazulin, and we tried oral praziquantel, uh, and they survived, and uh, we didn't see any problems at all. Now, we actually had some scomber, some scombrids inside the tank that were going to Montreal. I, I actually flew those myself there, and we wanted to treat them with flumicin. So we thought, you know what, these animals, 
let's give it a try. So, uh, and we did the flumicin in the tank with the scomber and the sunfish, and they didn't have any problems. So, but this leads me to a conclusion that I'll get back to, and I'm nearly finished now, uh, which is there's huge, huge variability, individual variability. There's some animals that just seem to work so well, and you can do whatever you want within reason, obviously, while other animals, the, the things just don't work as well. So very close to finishing because we didn't have any clients. I had a nice video here for you. I don't know why the hell these videos are not working. I just tested them 13 times. But anyway, it's just a cool video of the guys releasing this sunfish. This, uh, this is actually a shot from the video. And this is actually our new collection method. This is a small zodiac. This is where the sunfish went out into the ocean to be released. And this is how we now collect them. Basically, the guys go out in this small little zodiac, they see the dorsal fin, they put on a latex glove and they grab the animal and they put it inside that tiny little box that you see there. And then we shoot back to shore and in 20 minutes, we're back in our holding station. So this by far is the easiest collection method we've had and it works very, very well. Uh, so lessons learned. We did have 100% survivorship on all the transports, although we did not have uh, long-term survivorship. But it seems that temperature plays a very, very important role. The guys from uh, Stralsund in Germany and uh, Denmark uh, clearly had the best results, and they keep their animals in relatively colder water, 17 and a half. And like I said before, there's huge individual variability, and uh, it does seem that these animals will take the warming. Now, I did run over my time for two minutes, so I'm not going to do some shameless advertising uh, after all. And I thank you, Tierney, for mentioning the books in the beginning. And I will just hand over to Ugu very quickly. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you guys today. So thank you very much, Ron. I will share my screen in presentation. Just a minute here. Okay. Okay, I think is you are all seeing the presentation. So thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about this amazing fish in this amazing symposium. Uh, I will share some experience that we have in the husbandry of this amazing fish and I'll talk about grow and feeding strategy. Um, about Mola Mola. And I will certainly leave more questions to ask, to, to give uh, answers than I can, can really give. Uh, so um, I really like this image. I think it shows an idea that it, I think most of us had that Mola Mola is an obligate jellyfish eater. But the truth is that things have changed as we already saw during this symposium. There are several articles that show that Mola Mola is not an obligate gelatinous plankton feeder and have a more generalist diet depending on the age and the size of the animal. And also I believe that public aquariums can have an important role of the knowledge of these species like uh, feeding matters, um, like grow rates, food consumption and veterinary cares. But there's too many things to, to talk. I will get only to the... Um, feeding strategy at human care and the growth rate. And different institutions uh, has their own diet um, to feed these animals, but there are some points in common and this table resumes some of the diets used at different institutions. Um, I highlight some two of the most important that I think is the most important, that, that is the water and the solids in the meals, the amount of them. And I will show how this can affect the growth of the animals by showing some of the case studies at Oceanarium and compare also with other institutions. I call study case study, but the animals weren't at Oceanarium for scientific purpose. 
They are considered ambassadors of each species and we keep them by the best conditions. And this uh, make us able to learn more and more and more each, with each animal. In this slide, I have the first three case studies. Each graph and table represent one animal, where we have the weight of the animal that follows a linear growth, like it was shown in the work of Nakatumo and Iros in 2007, that I strongly advise to read. The dots represent the percentage of food by body weight, and the triangles, the calories by kilogram. The main difference from case study one and two and three it's that we increase the percentage of food by body weight in the first months of life because we decrease the calories by kilogram in order to give meals uh, with a high percentage of water. You can see here in the green circle that we have changed the percentage of food by body weight. And uh, we also change the type of food by increasing uh, the amount of water and decreasing the calories. In this slide here, we can see two uh, more case study. Actually, the last one is the animal we are keeping now. You can see here um, the number five uh, is the one that we are keeping in our institution and for more than 1,000 days. And for these two cases, the percentage of body of food by body weight is similar for the first case, but the kilocalories per kilogram decreased almost for half of the month. This was made in order to increase more the percentage of water in the meals. As you can see over here. This slide here compares the first case to the last case. And here is easier to see the difference between the two of them. Although we turn to 5% of, of the food by body weight in the first months of life, we are now using more water and less solids. And the meals have less kilocalories by kilogram that we were using 50 years ago. This seems to affect the growth rate, as we can see in the picture. Comparing both animals at 1,000 days, we can see a difference of almost 50 kilograms between animals. They grow slowly, and it's important to remember that in our case, we work in a closed system. For example, temperature maintains the same around 22 degrees all over the year, so we can compare data with more certain. In this table, we can see resumes showing how less kilocalories affect the growth rate. And by taking an example of Mola Mola for Northern Zia scenario, an animal that lives more than 2,000 days and reach more than 600 kilograms, it can show that kilocalories affect the growth. Also, although the questions about how uh, kilocalories affect the growth rate, uh, we can see that there's actually in different institutions, different ways to feed the animals, but there are similar ideas that we can see in the table about the percentage of food by body weight and calories by kilogram. And it's notorious that we have to reduce the amount of food and calories through time. And this information is well documented in the work that I already mentioned. Putting all together our our own experience through the years, the experience of different institutions and the outputs from the field's work for us at a scenario with our, with our water quality parameters, etc. This seems to be the line to follow to guarantee the best development of Molo Molo in our institution in terms of feeding. But we believe this is an exercise have to be made for each institution because of the difference in exhibition design, the size, the water temperature, etc. But we believe that what we have here in this table is the K, um, uh, K values to use for the good condition of Mola Mola in our institution. So in terms of concluding remarks, we believe that younger Mola Mola below 100 kilograms, as already sh been shown here in, in some works, seems to take benefit from a high calorie intake and more diverse diet. Uh, larger individuals or over 100 kilograms shift towards a low calorie intake by body weight and percentage of food by body weight. 
Water intake is regarded as a key ingredient in sun's fish diet, and weight and body condition monitoring should ultimately be used to fine tune in the real time diet plans regarding the welfare of the animal. Because one rule doesn't fit all, and we believe there is more answers and more questions to ask than answers that we can give. This is some of the questions that we believe need more uh, work. Like, does the growth rate vary between males and females? If yes, how should the diet be adapted? What is the best of is the best expected growth rate for the animals? How the temperature influence the growth rate? What amount of water liters per day should these animals really ingest? And how is simplified stomach and unyuk anatomy related to the amount of food they need to ingest per day? So there's lots of questions that need to be answered. So it's very quick, but I would like to say thanks to Terry and Michael for a used aquariums in this book in order to have the information together. It's really important that we can give ours our uh, contribution. And also, I would like to say thanks to all the co-authors for sharing the data. So thank you very much. OK. Here we go. So um, here we are. We're at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, this is the Open Sea exhibit. Uh, it's where we currently hold our molas. We've got 120 centimeter fish, about 80 kilograms, but he's usually down low, but maybe he'll make an appearance. We'll see. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So, um, uh, mola mola is a very exciting species to work with. May sound like hyperbole, but just about every aspect is uh, really challenging. Um, and as John mentioned, the opening of the symposium, studying this fish takes monumental efforts, that's for sure. Um, fortunately, we had an amazing professional community willing to share tips and tricks, and, and over the years, we've improved animal welfare and best practices. Um, while it can be difficult to rigorously study the living collections, uh, data efforts serve to boost our knowledge and our levels of success. So continued efforts towards standardization and collaboration will be a key part of this success. So a quick note on water quality, um, particularly dissolved oxygen. Um, the late Dr. Denz Denzaburo Inaba from Tokyo Fisheries um, composed the proverb, yo kyo kun, which literally translates as water specimen food. Um, so these words propose the basics of aquarium rearing, where the most important aspect is water, um, followed by condition of the specimen and quality of the food. So husbandry research, including captive management strategies for the ocean sunfish are rooted in the concept of this proverb, water, specimen, food. Um, successful rearing of any species starts with excellent water quality, the yo. Um, and modern large scale aquarium systems use probes that constantly monitor water parameters. Particularly important for MOLA is dissolved oxygen. Um, there are documented accounts suggesting that rapid drops in as little as 5% DO can cause harmful conditions for the sunfish. This is why real-time alerts are critical and why logging of historical trends are valuable when assessing sunfish behaviors. Uh, and as Joao discussed earlier, it's critical to boosting that way up for those long transports. And another interesting side note through earlier talks, we know that these molas out in the wild are diving down to the OMZ in foraging. So um, that's just an interesting dichotomy there. So I'm not sure why it's different in the aquarium setting. Um, but let's talk a little bit about captive growth. To, um, Hugo just showed us some cool graphs. Um, but keeping track of growth and consumption is critical in managing the healthy specimens, the gyo, uh, providing sunfish with food, the kun, at appropriate amounts and nutritional value is, um, is uh, key to tracking uh, health. Um, for all data sets to be easily comparable, standardizing data collection is desirable. And while aquarium protocols might vary slightly, but not only that, individuals um, techniques can, can, can vary when you're measuring live creatures. But here are some examples of some, some general good measurement strategies. Uh, this one's taken from Phillips et al. 2018, um, a paper discussing isometric growth. Uh, here's an example of MBA's field data sheet 
uh, a lot of similar measurements there. Um, interesting side note, the aquarium data tends to corroborate isometric growth. Um, and a fun fact is that every initial measurement of sunfish that MBA's made over the past 20 plus years, uh, so fish ranging like 40 to 70 centimeters total length, um, and as long as their fins are totally intact, it reveals that the over the curved girth taken at the base at the anterior edge of both fins will almost invariably equal the total straight length fin tip to fin tip. Um, but here's some other examples of ways to measure sunfish. There's homemade calipers. This was uh, in water measurement. The animal was feeding, so he was pretty distracted. Uh, we can use lasers and some digital imaging software. Um, just need to calibrate the lasers first and make sure you're taking that video at a 90 degree angle to get accurate measurements. And there's also direct measurements. Um, so this can be done right here. The fish actually has some water flowing into its mouth so it can get some water across its gills and, and breathe. Um, and a little PSA, since this is a husbandry talk, always wear your gloves and minimize your handling. Um, so anyway, so we've got our measurements. Um, so when we obtain the measurements, we'll look at a data um, that we have in table three from our chapter in the book. And this is generated by our friends at Kamigawa SeaWorld. Uh, and we use it as basically a guide. And if, if we look at our length and weight and we're in the, the same ballpark, then we feel pretty good that we've manage the fish's consumption rate pretty well and will continue to adjust over time. As Hugo mentioned, it's it's a kind of a daily ritual here. You look at the fish, see how its conditions are, what its behaviors are, and, and you go from there. Um, but again, this is just a, a, a ballpark guide for us. Um, so consumption, uh, Hugo talked a little bit about consumption. I just wanted to mention a specific incident here. So you can see this fish, this was 0510. Those big rolls that you see there, that, that's actually the, the hypodermis displaced by adipose tissue underneath. So this fish was eating too much um, kcals pretty much. Um, so we're still figuring out what the rate is, but as Hugo mentioned, we know that that drops as, as they, um, grow. And of course, other factors like temperature, uh, shape and volume of the exhibit, those will probably have an effect as well. Um, but how, how you manage this fish uh, plays a role in, in, the, in the data we're taking. So years ago, we used to offer this fish food once a day, um, but there are other feedings in the tank back here, most notably the tuna broadcast feeds. Uh, we noticed that the molas were consuming a lot of squid during those feeds, so we actually started counting them and and this is what we found so the the um let's see here uh, the blue diamonds which are mostly hidden by these pink diamonds are the is the amount of of kcals per kilogram a day that we wanted the fish to consume the separate pink represents the kcals it actually consumed so at, at some point this fish learned that it could get squid as they rain down from the from the top. And as you can see, it's a huge difference in actual kcals that we wanted it to, to, to consume. Um, so as a result of, of grabbing this info and, and looking at it, we decided to change our management strategies. And we, from, from then on out, target twice a day. And once a day corresponds with the tuna feed. So we keep them at their own station occupied and they're only receiving the amount that we want them to receive. And, and that has done a lot towards helping manage those fish. Um, another thing I just wanted to briefly touch on, this is something that I think we need to develop. We haven't really done this at all, is to develop ethograms for these fish. And I know that's mostly a behavioral thing, but you can add in body condition and, and, and such. You know, so I'm looking at this fish, um, 0907, it was actually the first fish that came back into this exhibit when we remodeled. Um, you can see, you know, it's got some abrasions at its fin tips, so we would note something like that. But you can see the, the coloration is looking pretty good. He's got some a little bit of those rolls at the fin bases. So those are all things that we could 
um, as an aquarium group, we could standardize and, and, and that would really help improve our communications and ability to share and interpret uh, what our management strategies are, how they affect the fish. Okay, so here's some um, information regarding anatomical necropsy data. Um, comparative organ and tissue disposition data can shed light on how conditions affect overall health. Um, so a lot of people are, are taking necropsy data either from you know, captive fish um, or fresh wild moribund fish, um, like sea lion toys, here's an example. Uh, this poor small fish, we, we had to, we pivoted. It was still alive, it has no fins and actually lost all of its organs there, but we were doing some other studies, but as just as an example here. Um, and also stranded fish, you know, the, the challenge with stranded fish is you don't know how long it's been there because you know, it's, it's one thing to look at organ mass and organ size and, and compare that to total length and, and mass of the whole fish. But I think what we really need to look at is the histopathology and the histo, oh uh, yeah, histopathology, pardon me. Um, because that basically is gonna help us understand the underlying factors that may contribute to the disease both naturally and as a result of the captive management. So we can look at, at the, how the, the cell, cellular makeup has changed over time. So it'd be great to get a comparative data set with some of these healthy fish out in the wild and see what they look like. And then we can understand what's going on, you know, as we manage these fish in captivity and, and if we need to adjust our strategies based on those results. Um, so again, standardizing um, our necropsy procedures would be um, great. Like I said, I'm sure there's lots of protocols out there. I know at North Sea up in Denmark, they've got a great protocol and a lot of aquariums are using that. So I would encourage, encourage that more. Um, and then going really fast here, um, another set of data that we've looked at to help us manage uh, would re relate to some tagging stuff. Um, so back in the early 2000s, uh, we contributed, MBA helped out uh, with a study that eventually was published as Dewar et al. in 2010 uh, using these PSATs like, like this one you see here. Um, and we demonstrated that the fish are urethermal, so they tolerate a wide range of temperatures. That's good. Um, then we also helped out with uh, the, this paper that Tierney published in 2015. And the, we wanted to know if we could raise the temperature in our exhibit slightly. And in looking at the data from these tags uh, helped us make an informed decision and, and let us know that we indeed could raise our temperature slightly. Um, so. After these initial studies, uh, MBA considered the addition of a release protocol to our management plan. Uh, at this point, no sunfish had been tagged in Monterey, so we began deploying tags on, on pretty large fish over 100 centimeters um, locally. And here we go. So here's off our uh, collection vessel, Lucille. We've got a fish here. I think this one's about 180 centimeters, putting a tag in. And there you can see it on the, on the side just below its dorsal gonna let it go and there it swims away so we got a lot of good baseline data for for wild fish in Monterey Bay so we needed that baseline data so we um, could understand what happens to our fish when we release them um, so we had two questions for you know to answer with our release fish first uh, will the sunfish actually survive the release process and and therefore we can assume it's time spent as a ambassador in our ex exhibition. Uh, and our second question it was, will these sunfish return to normal behaviors as compared to those demonstrated um, from the data in the wild deployments? Um, so as to the first question, so we've got some pictures of extractions here. Um, the tags were programmed to release at a depth, uh, if depth, plus or minus 2.5 meters remain constant for 72 hours. So i.e. if they were dead on the bottom. Uh, no tags are released in this manner. So we feel good about the fact that our animal care strategies and release protocols do not have catastrophic effects on the fish. So that's good. Uh, for the second question, 
uh, uh, the initial review of behavioral data suggests that indeed they do return to wild behaviors in terms of diving and directional travel. Um, so this further validates the program. And I should note as an aside, it's interesting when we talk about it on a genetic shifts in diet, all these fish came in, you know, 50 centimeters before they're really diving into um, gelatinous diet. But when we release them, they're 150, 170 centimeters where that comprises a big part of their diet. So the fact that they're doing these repetitive dives suggests that their instincts are pretty strong. And we're assuming that they're um, feeding since they're surviving. You know, some of these deployments are six months long. Um, so then one thing I would note, and here's some just some cool pictures of us moving. You can see the fish, we're lowering the fish all the way down three stories and then getting them back out to the wild. Um, you know, I would say the fact that we're right next to the bay is a strong motivator for our release program and the approvals granted through local agencies. But I do want to note, it's not to say that, that landlocked aquariums should not display this iconic species. On the contrary, the achievements and longevity and success demonstrated in, in places like uh, the Oceanario in Lisbon, uh, Oceanographic in Valencia and North, North Zone Aquarium in Denmark, um, and along with many in Japan, uh, that's validation enough for those programs. I mean, they're keeping these animals for so long. The value of exhibiting the sunfish to the public is great and, and makes it worth it. Um, I wish I could have showed some videos, but we, I'm already running late. Uh, lots of thanks, Tierney, John, Graham, for all your guidance, uh, all my co-authors, ton of people on the MOLA team, Ray, Melissa, and Teresa especially, a lot of folks on our collections team, and, and of course, people at Kamigawa SeaWorld, you guys really got it started here. I should note, I don't advocate riding MOLAs, but this is cool, cool uh, picture. And I also wanted to share some more art for my daughter because I want to thank my family. Anyway, thanks so much. Let me see if I can get out of here. I'll stop sharing. Ah, oh, Mike, that was great. And thank you. Thank you for persevering through through um, <laughs> the technical the technical snafus. You, you pulled it off. Sure. Sorry about that, everybody. But I'm um, trying to show you the cool oh, yeah. back here. <laughs> no worries. You've, you've had the best backdrop um, imaginable. So, so yeah. And I love the artwork from your kids. Ah, thanks. I think, um, you know, when I saw first saw a picture of a mola on my, the door of my graduate advisor, I said, you know, that look, looks like the way I draw a fish when I was little. <laughs> so I think it lends itself well to that. Um, well, I would love, you know, your chapter has been highly anticipated by a lot of people. I know folks at, um, my, my colleague at, at SeaWorld, Scott Gass, is like, oh, I can't wait to read that chapter. So I'm just so, so grateful for the collegial collaborative work that's gone in, that went into that chapter. Um, because as you say, all these, you know, the MOLA are individual. And each one of them reveals another secret um, to husbandry. You know, some will just adapt so quickly and others will rub their face off. And you just, it's right. just through lots of trial and error and getting to know, you know, getting to think like a mola. There are definitely patterns, um, you know, across the species. But as, as others have alluded to, each one reacts differently. Um, and each one has their own journey. I, I think Hugo and Joao would, would agree with that. And, and uh, sometimes it's easier than others, but, uh, I, and I must admit I'll, our first draft of this, of our chapter might've been a bit rambling, but I think it was like 20,000 words and way over the limit. I, you know, we could, we could easily do a chapter for each subheading of, of, uh, of the husbandry topics. Yeah, yeah, no, a absolutely. Each each animal is is a journey. I remember. Um, I just have one little anecdote I'll share because um, I know John Jonathan probably has some some questions too. Um, when I first came to the aquarium to do some some work on the molas back in the nineties, um, that you had just figured out how to quarantine them, and it was before they went really on full display. And David Packard 
who, um, you know, uh, was the person whose idea was to, to make this aquarium, was feeding the, the sunfish. And once you feed them and they're done, they will spit right in your face. <laughs> and, well, and well, indeed. I, the, so, so that's what this sunfish had done. And I said, you just, you know, don't be spitting in the face that feeds you. <laughs> so, but I think it, it actually endeared him and endeared the fish to, to David Packard. So, so, um, yeah, we we can learn so much, and and then it, it informs our work in the field. Absolutely, you know, I, yeah. that that story in itself, I would imagine, you know, these little molas, it's it's just an instinctual behavior when they're down on the bottom, they're probably spitting, mm. and in uncovering, you know, little things for them to suck up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know we know their their kin, the puffers are very adept and triggers, you know, the other tetrodoniforms are very adept at, at spitting water out to overturn their prey and the big muscles to do that. So, so um, they do have that ability. So yeah, you learn, you learn so much by having them, having them in, um, in captivity and, and to just bring them to the world. And I, I found that they have, like I was mentioning to Julie earlier this morning, they really draw people in. Having Indeed. them be there as this ambassador, it's it's really such important work, I think, um, to just spark people's curiosity and their imagination. You know, the ocean never disappoints. It's always going to provide some crazy creature. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, I'm just going to chip in on the back of it. I think like Judy said earlier in the day, like rock star, they kind of are, and I think we all need rock stars in our life so i think the work you do is yeah it's really needed you know i think you probably you um everyone loves a trip to the aquarium but to see something like that can change your whole perception for life i think and i just wanted to say like big thanks on everything that went into the book chapter as well i mean you guys you know you're professionals you don't have to share all this kind of stuff and you did and it was such a kind of outpouring of information and i learned so much and as you say when you're just working through everything it just makes you think about the field and what you're going to learn can i throw that question at you all collectively when we were rambling earlier about that shift in diet and like biomechanics do you think a big molar really simple question can tip itself up and feed off the bottom do you think that shift towards gelatinous prey say it like this is because they kind of wanna or because they literally can't feed off the seabed anymore when they become beasts hugo you have any comments <laughs> i mean I, I i would i would say they do you know we've some you know sometimes when we're getting ready to release a fish we if we have the opportunity we transfer it to a um, three meter holding tank and you'll you'll see him going on the bottom you know looking around it's, it's a very dirty tank and you know just visually kind of looking at things conversely you know we see him in the aquarium here there's my hand we see him in the aquarium in that in that cleaning posture quite a bit um you know if they've got like an, a scratch or something it, you know so there's there's also all sorts of observations that that we make that when I hear these other talks where smarter people have, you know, put, got the data and, and, and proven these sorts of things, we're, we're kind of seeing a lot of these behaviors and, and concepts in a day-to-day -day fashion. It's, it's, we're very lucky to be in that position. Yeah, I think those channels of communication. Good. Hugo, sorry, man, I didn't catch what you said yet. I think you were on mute while you were, you were chatting there. Oh, sorry. Oh, there. Yeah, hey, no sometimes we see our mala mala really in the bottom looking, but it's something that is not usually. is is more in the pelagic area in the tank. So I think it's difficult to answer that. And because we have mala like two hundred grams, kilograms, three hundred kilograms, but huge huge mala. I don't know. I just know about the six one six six hundred kilograms mala from another sea aquarium. And I think in nature we can see one ton animals. I don't know if they can go to the bottom. It's difficult to answer. Yeah. Yeah. No. It just interests me. But I think. Yeah. I think Natasha said it. Those are the kind of things 
we can probably answer only ever in an aquaria unless we get super lucky um but no i've got nothing else tenny if you want to carry on i don't want to hug um, the floor. any any thoughts on um ranzania on display yeah. go ahead you guys I'll, I'll just say very quickly that we have had, as you know, as a collecting company, we've had requests, quite mm -hmm. a few, but they are um, uh, they're not easy to come by, uh, yeah. very very rare. But uh, they 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 do. Uh, we will give them a shot because we know quite a few folks out there are interested in in keeping them. We we, we would definitely be interested. I, I my gut tells me that they are very nervous and jittery fish and can probably swim really fat like as fast as as tuna and that causes me a little concern in an enclosure mm -hmm. but um it i want I, I would just plug one one quick thing i i had to take it out of my talk but conventional tagging i, I know it's not sexy but if we want to if we want to get a better idea on natural growth rates or if there's confluence between the the fish in the Mediterranean and up by England that's one really inexpensive way to do it and especially down the med where there's the set nets and the mm -hmm. tonnerellas you can get a lot of tags out uh, with relatively little effort as opposed to here where we're individually encountering them it's hard to get a lot of those tags out but you know mm -hmm. if anyone wants to yeah. bring me out and I'll fish and put some tags in <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That, that's actually a, a very, very good idea. And uh, I've been down there on the set net boat in days where they would catch like a hundred individuals. Uh, exactly. Uh, so yeah. absolutely. You know, you catch one of those days and you tag a hundred, um, you know, you get a hundred tags out there. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the question becomes when you release them, are they just caught in the next set net down the road or, or, Will they be at liberty for a year that we can get some recapture data on them? Who knows? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just say that we do a lot of tag and release blue sharks, and we get about a 10% return. Uh, and, of course, blue sharks, you know, they're, they're swimming in the sea of long lines. Uh, so we know a lot of them just get caught. These guys, it's hard to say, but uh, I would say, you know, we'd get a decent percentage back regardless of any wow. challenges they, they face down there. Let's make some plans. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to just thank you so much again for, for contributing to the book. It's just, it's such a valuable chapter. And I think it's going to be the go-to dog-eared reference for anyone and everyone who's in the display world of, um, you know, for MOLAs. So it's an Absolutely. invaluable resource. So thank you so much for, for thank you. Thank you, man. Um, oh, obrigado. Obrigado. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you later. <laughs>